Well, it's good to see you all uh, here this evening. Uh, I'll three more minutes of some of the superior now to go back to the seat. <laughs> but until then, I like that old rock song. I'm blinded by the light. <laughs> um, this couple of things. Number one, uh, Pastor Jack talked about. Please keep in prayer uh, this Friday and Saturday. Uh, Friday, you know, we're going to walk through everything and try to the best as we can uh, you know, with our finite ability. But God has the final say, so He always has the last word. Always does. And our desire is to reach people, to reach souls, to with the gospel of Jesus Christ, to get Bibles into their hands, and then to get them planted into churches. And teach the word of God. Plain and simple. Real simple. Uh, it's not, not difficult. But uh, it needs prayer. So I would ask you to really keep that in prayer. Saturday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, that's going to take place there. And we're just praying that uh, the Lord will bring those who uh, are hungry, not just for food or for medicine or for eye care or for whatever, but hungry in their soul. Jesus Christ. And so uh, help us, uh, help with the message. Uh, it is going to be on hope, Esperanza, hope. Um, and uh, Jose Luis is going to be translating uh, for me. So uh, we've been working together in that. He's a, he's a good translator. He translates very fast, right on top of it, which is what you want. You don't want space in between as much as possible. So keep it in prayer. That the people will hear. This past Sunday, we were talking about, you know, all the things they talked about. Remember the parable of the sower. We talked about the sower. We talked about the soil. This past Sunday, we talked about taking a look at the hearer and every single element that Jesus went through when he spoke. He said, "Hear, hearing." Hearing they did this, hearing that this happened, hearing that that, hearing they did that. So let's kind of unpack even at a, a greater level the idea of hearing. There was a, a wife who challenged her husband to a little one time. She said, I ain't gonna tell you, Bill. Now let's see if you can figure it out. Now, are you good with numbers? And he goes, yeah, I'm pretty good with numbers. I said, okay, here we go. First of all, it's a riddle about a train, and you're the engineer on the train. Now, the train has 36 people on board. Got that? He goes, yeah. At the first stop, 10 got off and two got off. Got that? I got that. At the next stop, no one gets off, but five get on. Got that? Got it. At the third stop, Four get off and two get on. Now, here's the question. He goes, what is it? She said, what is the name of the engineer? <laughs> and he goes, excuse me? He said, uh, how would I know? And she goes, honey, see, you don't listen. Right at the start, I said, you were the engineer. <laughs> Ooh, it's okay, but that's the situation. This little story really shows us how often we often fail to listen carefully. Now, with husbands, uh, I say to their wives, and so forth and so on. Um, there was another one, that, another little story that uh, went something like: one husband dropped his newspaper and he looked directly into his wife's eyes and gave her his full attention while she was speaking and she hollered stop it she said you're deliberately listening just to confuse me <laughs> so we all have this listening situation and it's not unusual well jesus is talking about listening really listening and Just as we often fail to listen carefully to other people, so we often fail to listen. We don't listen carefully to who? The Lord. And what the Lord is saying to you, what the Lord is, is saying to me, we, we, we think we hear. 
when we take a, a snapshot of it, but then we move on. Uh, his word is often clear on the issue that we're facing. Whatever issue you're facing, this, this information is exquisitely clear. But our minds are already made up and we don't want to hear what God says because it confronts the direction that we don't want to go with. Uh, Lord, I want to go in this direction. I've pretty well figured out what I need to do. God goes, uh, I wouldn't go down the direction of our way. I wouldn't do that. But a lot of times we, we, we want to have our own way. God can speak clearly. But if we're not listening clearly, we miss his will for our minds. And that's it. You know, in the text that we're looking at here, Jesus warns in, in Luke 8.18. Remember he said, take care how you listen. That's an uh, NLC translation. Take care how you listen. I like that translation. Am I taking care of how I listen? Am I paying attention to how I listen? Which is important. Is, is Jesus addressing the crowd or just the twelve? Well, the full exhortation, basically, of verse 18, seems better suited to the whole multitude. But there does seem to be this break between Jesus' private explanation of the parable, and that's in Luke 8, 10 to 15, and these verses, which leads right to the view that he is speaking only to the twelve. And here's one of the reasons why. The flow of thought seems to go back to verse 10. If you notice that, it goes back to verse 10 where Jesus explains that the purpose of his parable was both to reveal truth to the spiritually responsive and to conceal truth from the spiritually superficial. I say, now, wait a minute, what are we talking about? I'll break it down before us. Jesus does not want his disciples to think that his main purpose is to conceal the truth. But watch me. What's happening here? And I'm not speaking out of both sides of my mouth. So he gives the illustration of the lamp being set. Remember that? He talks about the lamp. He ties it right into the soils. The lamp being set on what? A lampstand, not under, not hidden under a container or a bed, to show them that the main purpose of his teaching is to illuminate the truth, not to hide it. But who did he give the truth to? To them. Here's the thing. But at the same time, light serves two functions. It illuminates, but it also exposes. That's what light does. The sun's just below the building, the sun I can see. But that's what light does. It illuminates, right? It fills this room. But what does it also do? It exposes things. Have you ever thought that you know everything was good on the wall until you shine a real uh, heavy light on it? You can see the spots on the wall. Uh, it needs a paint job or whatever like this. But without the proper light, you can't see it, can you? And that's it. That's what he's talking about. There's illumination, but there's also exposing. And what's the exposing? Jesus is teaching not only illuminates the truth, it also exposes the evil that lurks in the dark corners of the human heart. And that's Luke 8, 17. He exposes the dark corners that are there. And we all have the dark corners. We're all fallen individuals. I'm, I'm a fallen person, saved by grace. And that's it. Therefore, the whole idea is we must take care of how we listen so that we respond obediently to Jesus' teaching rather than shrink from it because... It convicts us of sin. I don't like this because it convicts me. I don't like this because I'm screwing when someone's talking. It's like they're talking, they're talking to me. They're, 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 you know, they must know something because they're talking right to me. I've had people say that. I go, I don't know anything. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is convicting your heart. I don't convict. I, the job's taken. It was taken a long time ago by the Holy Spirit. That's not my job. My job is just to deliver the Word of God. The Word of God. God, the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to convict our own hearts. And each of us here, different. Every single of us here is different. And that's the issue. For instance, if we respond obediently, we will receive more life. If we shrink back, 
What light we think we have will be taken from us. Remember he talked about that? Let's explain what that really means. Since God's truth is revealed in Jesus, we must listen carefully and obediently for his teaching. Ultimately, or I should say his teaching, ultimately will do what? He will judge us. That teaching is going to judge. Okay? In verse 16 and 17, makes the point that God's truth is revealed in who? In Jesus Christ. Also, in verse 18, applies it by stating that we must listen carefully or that very truth will someday judge us. One thing, God's truth is revealed in Jesus Christ. We know that. Like it, it's in verses 16 and 17. But here are some purposes behind what we're talking about. Here's one. The main purpose of Jesus' teaching is to illuminate God's way to us. And that's Luke 8, 16. It illuminates what? The Bible to us. You know, many commentators understand verse 16 and 17 to be a, kind of like an exhortation of, uh, to the disciples uh, to function as light. And basically, when you receive the word of God, you and I are to function what? As light. Light to who? Light to a dark world. I'm, I, God has given me this light. God has given you the light. What do we do with it? Well, I don't know that. Well, I don't know that. Let it shine to other people. Like I said this past Sunday, remember this little light of mine? I'm going to let it shine. That is so elementary, but it is so true. Okay? They're not to hide God's word from the people, but to preach it clearly. The main support for this verse is the connection that we have with Matthew 5, verses 15 and 16. You might want to write that down. Matthew 5, verses 15 and 16, where Jesus uses the illustration of the light on the lampstand and then applies it by telling us to let our light shine before men. But the lamp on the lampstand illustration seems to be one of Jesus to use it many, many times. And we, we got to understand the interpretation of that in each context. Now, there are some that argue back and forth. I want to give you several camps to talk about here, several points of teaching. Some argue that the context of Luke 8 fits this you know, interpretation that the disciples are to take the words which Jesus presently was compelled to speak in parables and make them plain after his resurrection and ascension. Uh, one of the commentators in there is, is Nobel Bloodhart. He's, he's he, in his book, Commentation, Com Commentary on the Gospel of Luke, and that's on page 247. This is his point. This is what he's talking about. Now, while this is a possible interpretation, I, I am not opposed to it as a secondary means of Jesus' words, but I think the primary meaning is slightly different. When I take a look at this and I go through these scriptures, I think that Jesus is clarifying verse 10. Look at verse 10. He's clarifying. So that the 12 do not mistake his point. What's he teaching? Jesus is teaching is the light that is put on the lampstand. It's his teaching that's the light that's put on the lampstand. His words are not given for the primary purpose of concealing God's truth, but for revealing it. The same light that reveals truth, again, like I said, what does it do? It reveals, but what does it also do? It exposes sin. It exposes sin. Because of this twofold function of the light of God's truth, no one can respond naturally to Jesus' teaching without having the Holy Spirit guide them. Either we respond obediently and draw close to God, or we ignore it and deceive ourselves. And how many times do we know people on both camps? They immediately go to the Word of God because they're drawn to it. But then there are those people that will respond and they'll, they'll push it away. Well, I don't like this. Why don't they like them? They're not comfortable. Why aren't they comfortable? Because the Spirit is condemning their heart on something, whatever it may be. That's it. Let's consider how Jesus is saying in verse 16 applies to us, for instance. The lamp was a small clay pitcher with a spout. It was filled with oil and had a wick in it, basically. Those were the lamps. And obviously a person didn't take that kind of lamp and 
put it under something. They, they say they left it out in the room. You know, he lit it so that he could see and what was going on in his house. The obvious explanation of it is simply this. Okay. In other words, the lamp had a very specific function. Without it, a person was going to bump their shins on furniture. Anybody would do that in the dark? Man, that hurts. Oh, you bump your toe, you have no shoes on. Oh, man, you just curl your hair. Okay. Because there's no light. And that's the point. He would trip over, you know, the guy, even in those days, he would trip over the kid's toys, uh, left on the floor or whatever, and, you know, he couldn't see how to cook, couldn't, they couldn't see how to do anything in the house, what, without a lamp? Because when darkness came, they didn't have electricity, like us, it was a lamp, and that was it. In the same way, God has given us what? The lamp. Here's the lamp, right here. It's the Bible, okay? including the teaching of Jesus to shed light on how we should live so that we don't grope around in the darkness whacking our shins on obstacles that the word warns us about. God warns us about things, but in the dark we're going to whack our shins on those things because we're not paying attention to them. In other words, we're going to stumble over top of stuff that God doesn't want us to stumble over because he's given us his word. Many people, especially young people, want to know the will of God for their lives. I've asked at many times, anybody here want to know the will of God? Everybody puts up their hand. Anybody here want to know the will of God? Of course, everybody wants to put up their hand. Uh, here are some of the things that especially young people, they want to know, you know? Uh, they want to know a couple of things. Let me back that up. See if I can get to that. They want to know, like, uh, who shall I marry? Uh, or what should I do with my life? And on and on and on. God's Word reveals principles on each of these crucial questions so that you don't whack your shins on the wrong ways of life. He has information. Now, they're general information. You're not going to go in there. God's going to tell you, well, I want you to do a, a two years in college and become uh, a welder uh, or do this. He's not saying that. But it's general information that's good information. Clearly, God, God's will is that you should, regarding to marriage, what does it say about marriage in the Bible? Does it say a little bit about marriage in the Bible? Yes. Like Ephesians 5, and on and on and on and on and on it goes, okay? Clearly, God's will states that what? Uh, you should marry only a spiritually minded, God centered Christian because the word commands us not to be what? Uh, equally yoked, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 18. It clearly states that, right? His will is that we should spend our lives serving the Lord Jesus Christ, whatever we do to earn a living. If you're a plumber, be a plumber for Jesus Christ. If you're a carpenter, be a carpenter for Jesus Christ. If you're sweeping the floors, sweep the floors better than anybody else for Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. Because we are to seek first the kingdom of God. Remember Matthew 6, 33? Mm -hmm. That's what he's talking about right here. We are to be, he talks about, we need to be morally pure. Because his will is our sanctification. You might want to write down 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it talks about his will being our sanctification. These are many other vital principles for right living. Are revealed to us in God's word. Because plain to say, here's the one that we want to get to. How's it fit today? Without God's word, people are wandering in this dark, dangerous world without illumination from God. I need the illumination that only God's word can give to me, that only the Holy Spirit can give to me, and can give to you. And without it, I'm wandering around banging into things that I shouldn't have to bang into, that I shouldn't have to be hurt by. That's the whole point. They're falling into open holes of drugs, of drug use, of sexual immorality, anger, bitterness, self-centeredness, greed, uh, and a host of other sins. They're falling into it. Why? Because they're not following the Word of God. That doesn't mean that a Christian is, is perfect. No, we're not. But we strive to follow the word of God to have a better quality of life and to be light to the other person. God's word is the light that tells them how to walk so that they don't destroy themselves with sin. 
the whole point of the issue of salvation is not for God to gather a bunch of folks together so he can spend eternity with us. No. The whole point of salvation is while you're sitting down here, you need to share that light with somebody else. Because they're on the way to hell. We talked about that this past Sunday. As believers, we must live in the light of God's word ourselves. Then, by our example and our words, we must help others see God's way. You, know, you may wonder, why would everybody want God's light to illuminate their lives? Think about that for a second. Why would everybody want this word? It's so, it's so simple. It's so straightforward. It's not, it's not complicated. Why, why wouldn't they want that? Okay? And basically... It illuminates their lives so that they can see how to avoid the holes and the dangers in the dark. Well, Jesus explained to us why people don't want that. And he explained it right here. There it is. Men love darkness rather than light. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be what? Exposed. John 3, verses 19 and 20. That's the reason why. Because that's the issue. Now this shows us something. What does it show us? It shows us this. A secondary purpose of Jesus' teaching is to expose all that is hidden in the human heart. And that's verse 17. It exposes things. Remember? It illuminates, but also what? It exposes things. Uh, there also is a debate about the meaning of this. Verse. There's a debate about lots of things in Scripture. And one theologian will say this, another theologian will say that. Some think that it refers to God's truth that will be made obvious through the apostles' teaching. Some think that. But the warning in the next verse to hear carefully fits better with the view that God's light exposes the sinfulness of the human heart. God's light will always expose the sinfulness in our heart and in your heart. Therein lies the danger. We all are inclined to hide from the light rather than to allow it to expose the, the fullness, basically, and the foulness of our heart. We have a tendency to hide from that. There's a story. Years ago, like probably in the 1800s or so, a wealthy Chinese businessman visited England, and he was fascinated by the power of a microscope. He never saw a microscope. And he wondered about this thing, and he uncovered it. So he went and he bought it, he was very wealthy, and he took it back to China. And he thoroughly enjoyed, you know, using it, looking all the things only in the microscope. And then one time he took some rice and he put it on the microscope that he was going to eat. <coughs> to his shock, he saw tiny little creatures crawling on it. <laughs> oh, oh. He didn't know what to do. Since rice was the main staple of his diet, what do you do? Well, finally, what did he do? In frustration, what did he do? He smashed the microscope to bits. <laughs> it had revealed something distasteful to him, so he destroyed the source of the discovery. You get where I'm going? Okay. That was rather foolish, but how many people do the same thing with the Bible? or with a sermon from the Bible that exposes their sin. What happens? They don't feel comfortable with what they see. So they get rid of the source rather than deal with the sin. That's why I was joking when I said, oh, when I was working in a nightclub, I had a little teeny pocket Bible and I set it at the table, probably this size, I'd read that. It would be off in the corner somewhere you have 45 minutes on, 15 minutes off, and I sat there and I had this little pocket Bible, the light really dim. This was bright for a nightclub. This was really, really dim. You'd be surprised how this part of the waters, nobody would go near that table. Okay? They look down and they go, oh, oh what's that? Oh, it's fine. Oh, run. You know, it's like <coughs> going like this to them, okay? No. Okay. What, what was it? I wasn't trying to. To be super spiritual. I wasn't trying to be religious. I just wanted to sit down and take a look at God's word. But it was exquisitely uncomfortable for them. Why? We all know why. It 
exposes things that they don't like. What is it? Remember you've heard me say this before? This is a mirror. And when you look into the mirror, you see every blemish there. Nothing is hidden. It's all there. And it's pretty bad. As a human being. They don't like that. The believer says, God, I trust you with my life. God, show me who I am. God says, you want to see who you are? Look into the mirror. When you look into the mirror, it takes your breath away. God says, now, I'm going to change you. I'm going to change you from the inside out. You're going to be, have a brand new heart. It's going to be a brand new you. Watch what will change. And it's changing on the inside, not the outside. Uh, when I was with Ralph, uh, his son, uh, Ryan, he's the youngest son. Uh, Ryan was just coming off of massive overdoses of cocaine. And uh, he was getting cleaned up, and he gave him a Bible, and he started to read it, he started to devour the Bible. And so, Raul has took me and Ryan and a bunch of others to send us to South America. Again, I still speak a word of Spanish, I guess that's what South America had to But uh, I was in a hotel room for about two weeks with a wine. And he just was devouring the Word of God. And God changed him from the inside out. He started to reach out to younger people, and still is if you want to follow that, but whosoever's. It was first called Exit, like Exit Out of Where You Are. And he had a couple of friends here, the head group uh, called POD. You might hear about POD, Payment on Demand. And it's a hard rock. But the leader of one other hard rock group, which was the most grossest hard rock group of the day. There's a group called Corn, K-O-R-N. They were gross. They were de demonic. And the leader of that turned his life over to the Lord. Now he was tattooed from one into the other. I don't think it was a square inch on his face or on his arms or on his body, but he did have a tattoo. Uh, he had everything pierced, he could possibly pierce. He had dreadlocks. No longer dreadlocks, but this is the situation. He turned his life over to the Lord. I had an opportunity to be with him uh, in Las Vegas for a while, and I remember when we were at this lady's house who uh, sponsored the crusade in New York, and there was a big old piano there, so I started playing these old hymns that I know. And he came in and he laid down on the floor. And he listened to those hymns, you know, like What a Friend We Have in Jesus, uh, you know, In the Garden, you know, these classic, classic songs, How Great Thou Art. And he started to cry. I said, uh, You okay? He said, I never heard something so beautiful. He looked the same on the outside. If you just saw him, you'd run screaming. But on the inside, new man. Completely new man. That's what God does with light. Light burns out the rockiness and gives you a brand new heart. And that's who this, this guy is. And he's on tour with, with Ryan right now in Mexico. I joke with Ryan, I say, you realize the irony of what, what's happening in your life and Raul's life? He says, what do you mean? He says, I said, Raul was born in Mexico City. He came to the United States and God just blew up the ministry for it. It was incredible. You were born in the United States. You go into Mexico and God is blowing up the ministry for you. Can you figure that one out? And he goes, I can't figure it out. I said, neither can I, but that's not. Okay? So he took a second generation and Ryan, if you cut off his long hair, he looks exactly like Ralph when he was in his late 20s and 30s. It's a spin image. It's like, whoa, okay. But uh, that's what God does. And so God will change you from the inside out. If you're outside, they never change. If you're tatted or whatever, but that has nothing to do with it. 
unfortunately, we do this. Oh, man, look at that. He's terrible. Look at the tattoos on his ear and across the forehead, stuff like this. Folks, there's a tattoo on his heart that says, owned by Jesus Christ. That's a tattoo that you want. That's what the light does. People don't feel comfortable with it. There's a story about a Puritan pastor by the name of Thomas Watson. Said concerning the scriptures, Thomas Watson said this, quote, Take every word as spoken to yourself. When the word thunders against sin, think thus. God means my sins. When it presses any duty, God intends me in this. Take it to yourself. This is a purity pastor. This is what he said. The point is simply this. And this is a, another commentary from Donald Whitney. Like I put the... Yeah, there's the... Oh. Many put off scripture from themselves as if it only concerned those who lived in the time when it was written. But if you intend to profit from the word, bring it home to yourself. A medicine will not, uh, will be no good unless it is applied. And that's the cycle. The medicine is not going to do you any good unless you apply the medicine. The Bible is not going to do you any good unless you apply it what, to yourself. And a lot of times we'll, we'll read about this and go, uh, you know, you, you need this. You need this. Uh, no, no, no. I need this. Before I say you need it, I need it first. Always apply it to yourself. And so that was the other thing. Another thought was this. Therefore, we must listen carefully, or that teaching will judge us someday. That's at verse 18. Jesus says, therefore, take heed how you listen. For whoever has to him shall more be given. Do you what he's saying? Go watch this. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has shall be taken away from him. Do you ever wonder about that verse? What are you talking about? Taken away from him. And here's the point. If we listen carefully, we will be given more light. That's verse 18a. Note the emphasis on hearing and listening in the context. I give you a bunch of scriptures in there. Uh, Luke 8, uh, 8, 10, 8, 12, 8, 13, 8, 14, 8, 15, 8, 18, 8, 21. All of it. Listening carefully to God's word involves several elements. How can I listen? Here's some elements for us to take a look at. First, listen carefully. Listening carefully means taking the time to read the word and meditate on its meaning. Even among those who attend church regularly, so many are simply ignored, uh, ignorant, basically, of the Bible. Because they do not take the time to consistently read and think about what's been said. What is the meaning behind it? In our busy schedule, we often rush through the devotion. Can I have that happen? Okay, let's pray. Okay, Lord, Lord, I thank you for this. Amen. What was that? Would you talk to a friend like that? Would you want a friend to talk to you like that? No. That's the whole point. We need to take time to do this. Secondly, listen carefully. Listening carefully means always looking for Christ in the Word. Do you look for Christ in the Word? Do I look for Christ in the Word? Uh, Jesus chastened the Jews by saying, I love this. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is these that bear witness to me. You search the scriptures, you think you have life in it, they speak of me. The Bible speaks of Jesus from cover to cover. Absolutely. Well, with the two men, for instance, on the road to Emmaus, Remember? Luke 24, 27, beginning with Moses? Jesus goes all the way back to Moses with all the, uh, and with all the prophets. Jesus explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Can you imagine that? I would, 
I would have loved to walk down that road and having Jesus Christ give you that kind of instruction. The one who wrote the book is telling you about the book that he wrote because it's him. That's priceless. Okay. Whether we're in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, we ought to draw close to the Lord Jesus if we are listening carefully to what God has revealed. I love a story about Spurgeon. They call Spurgeon the Prince of Preachers. Spurgeon tells the story about a young preacher who preached a very fine sermon. Uh, what Spurgeon called, quote, a highfalutin sermon. That was a technical term. It's a highfalutin sermon. Okay. When he was done, the young man asked the old Welsh preacher uh, who had heard him what he thought about it. The old man replied, he did not think it of much of it, really. And the young preacher said, well, why not? Okay. And this is what the preacher replied. Because there was no Jesus in it. Well, said the young preacher, my text did not seem to run that way. The old preacher said, never mind. But your sermon should have run that way. He went on. And this person said this. This is the way to preach, young man. He said, think about this. From every little village in England, it does not matter where it is, there is sure to be a road to London. Think about that. There's sure to be a road to London. Now, from every text in the Bible, there is a road to Jesus Christ. And the way to preach is just to say, how can I get from the text to Jesus Christ? That's what he's talking about. Right there. How can I do it? He said this. The young preacher said, well, but some, suppose I find a text that has not got a road to Jesus Christ in it. He was setting it up. The preacher said this. I have preached for over 40 years, said the old man, and I have never found such a scripture. But if I ever do find one, I will go over hedge and ditch. But what I will get to him for I will never finish without bringing in my master. It's perfect. It always leads to Christ. Always. It always does. Listening carefully means always seeking to apply the word to my own heart and life. You know, there's two questions that Paul asked the Lord on the road to Damascus. They're important questions that you and I should ask. Remember those questions? Simple question, right? Who are you, Lord? What shall I do, Lord? Those are the two questions he asked. In that order. But you notice he finished both of them with one word. Lord. Who are you? What do I do? Those two questions are linked. If he is the risen Lord and Savior who gives himself for my sins, then it has a great deal of bearing on how I must live. To read the word without applying it doesn't do us any good. Why? The word was not given to fill our heads with interesting facts, but to change our hearts and to conform it to Jesus Christ. It's not about the facts. And this is important. Now, I, I put this in here for a number of reasons, and I think we've all done this. We've all met people like this. I've met Christians who can tell you the tense of a Greek verb. Oh, it's a Greek verb. That is possible. It's this, it's that. They can tell you about that in the New Testament. Or who will argue a subtle nuance of some theological point. But their lives are a mess. And they're angry. And they're insensitive toward their own family. But they can tell you all that stuff. That's just head knowledge. It's not in their heart at all. The whole point of Scripture is summed up in those two great commandments. To teach us how to love God and to love one another. That's the idea. Uh, if we aren't learning to do that, we're missing the point. If we listen carefully to God's Word, and it's about hearing again, He will give us more life so that we can grow more. But, here's the point. If we listen superficially, what we think we have will be taken away from us. 
You're listening superficially. It's going in one ear and out the other. Is it accomplishing anything? It is not accomplishing what God set it out to do. Now, God said, my word will not come back for it. It won't. But what does that also mean? If I'm not paying attention to his word, his word is not going to come back for it. But guess what? I won't be understanding what he's saying. And what little I thought I knew, I wind up losing. Jesus is born in and this verse applies to the Pharisees who thought they knew Scripture, but missed the Messiah of whom the Scriptures prophesied. They thought they knew the Word of God. We know the Word of God, and that's it. Father Abraham is our father. Who is your father? You know that little line that they talk about Jesus Christ? They were basically saying that he was a bastard. He had no idea who his father was. Because Joseph is not your father. Your mom was pregnant before, but you know, you know what happened there, right, Joseph? This is, this is what the situation was, okay? God judged them by taking away, what did God do to Israel? How about in 70 AD? What did he do? He took away their temple and their land in the great destruction under Titus in AD 7. His warning also applied to Judas, who superficially listened to Jesus' teaching but did not apply it to his own heart. He didn't. Was Judas with the other guys? Did he hear the same thing that the other guys heard? No, he didn't. Because he wasn't paying attention. Now, I know it's for prophecy and it had to be fulfilled, and I get, I understand all of that situation. But it sunk in with the other 11. Who this man is. This is God. And I'm going to follow him. I'm going to turn my back on everything else and I'm going to follow him. Judas was, he was more interested in politics. He was more interested in, uh, in a champion for Israel. So Jesus should have come in on a white horse, you know, and slain the Roman Empire. No, that wasn't going to happen. His warning was that of these guys. The Pharisees and Judas were not uh, irreligious pagans. They weren't. The Pharisees weren't, certainly. They, they knew about the Bible. And again, they knew about the Bible. They didn't know the Bible. They didn't know the author of the Bible. And he, remember he said, you search the scriptures? What do they do? They speak of me, he says. They speak of me. This was it. They seem to be zealous for the things of God. Judas is one of the twelve, yet both the Pharisees and Judas, what? They paid no attention to what God was really doing. They thought. They thought they knew God, but they didn't know Him at all. Because they didn't apply His word to their hearts. In the end, they lost Him. They lost it all. Because there is this element of self-deception, we need to be very careful ourselves. Because we can deceive ourselves. Do you realize you can deceive yourself? It's easy. Oh, yeah. We can talk ourselves into anything. I can justify just about anything. Because that's my fallen nature. It is. It's easy. It's easy for spiritual pride to slip in. Be careful of that. Where our knowledge of the Bible fools us into thinking that we are spiritually mature because we know so much. It's not how much you know. It's who you know. Knowing the Bible is one thing. Knowing the author is another thing. You know the author. Then the Bible becomes something totally different. It's not a book of facts and figures and dazzling people with the Greek translations or the Hebrew translations. There's a place for all of that. Don't get me wrong. But knowing God, we must constantly confront ourselves with the standards of Scripture applied to our thoughts, our attitudes, our behavior, especially as seen in our own relationship at home. How's the relationship at home? How is God in your house? I guess that's the easiest way to say it. Uh, how's Jesus in your house? Uh, remember, a pastor did a sermon one time where he said, he dreamt that Jesus was knocking on the front door of his house. <laughs> he 
Mikado and he said, Jesus, uh, you want in my house? Jesus said, yeah, I want you to get in your house. So Jesus walks into the living room, everything's looking good. Jesus goes, uh, What's behind that door? Uh, well, that's uh, uh, that's my study. Can I can I see? Can I come in? Well, it's kind of messy. Can I see? Okay. And Jesus wound up going room after room after room. Um, finally, got the one and said, uh, "What's in there?" He said, um, "You don't want to go." Jesus wants to go into every room in your house. What's your house? This. Who you are. He wants to go into where you have your ego, and he wants to change it. He wants to go in where you have your pride, and he wants to change that room. He wants to go in where you have your lust, and he wants to change that room. He wants to go in, fill in the blank. All these rooms are inside of this house that I carry. In this house that you carry, it's not the brick and mortar house, it's this house. Years ago, there was a song, it's a country western song, it's called This Old House. Did anybody remember that song? It was done a long, long, long time ago. This old house is getting weak, this old house is trimble, uh, trimbles where the darkness is about. And then the chorus is, ain't gonna need this house no longer, ain't gonna need this house no more. Ain't got time to paint the shingles, ain't got time to paint the door. Uh, ain't gonna need this house no longer, I'm getting ready to meet the saints. And it was talking about, not a house, it was talking about a person. You're a living house. Am I letting him in every room? Let him in every room. He will clean it up, get it right, we're not perfect, but he will guide you in the midst of it. What does he say? Is my thoughts, is my thought life pure? Do I deal with my grumbling, unbelieving, my unthankful spirit? Does my family see the fruit of the spirit in me dealing with them every single day? If I put on a good front at church saying, Lord, Lord, if I don't practice this word in the private of my home, I will be shocked by Jesus, as he says to me, what are you doing? You gotta live a real life. See, the world lives phony lives. We all do that. It's blessed. They entertain because that's all they have. But when you take away the entertainment, why is it that you see so many people that are in Hollywood that wind up committing suicide or all these things? They make all the money in the world. They've got millions and millions and millions of dollars. They live in mansions that I can't even begin to imagine. They have bank accounts that's got more zeros behind it than you can possibly imagine. Why, why are they doing what they're doing? Because it's all a facade. Because nothing will fill you heard it, that void inside of it. It's only Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. He says that the, these things happen. Well, to kind of conclude basically this, sometimes people complain that reading God's word or listening uh, to it being preached is more. Well, I admit that some portions of God's word is very difficult, and I admit a lot of times that some pastors are very boring. Okay? But, <laughs> often, our problem is with our own attitude, not with the word or with the preacher. That's it. I close with this little story. Shortly before he died, Madeline A. Roland Hill. An 18th century British preacher, who was used greatly by God, was visiting an old friend who said, Mr. Hill, it is now 65 years since I first heard you preach, but I remember your text and part of your sermon. Well, asked the preacher, what part of the sermon did you recall? His friend answered, quote, you said that some people, when they went to hear a sermon, were very squeamish about the delivery of of a pastor. Then he said, the old man said something like this. Supposing you went to hear a will of one of your relatives read, 
and you were expecting a legacy from him, you would hardly think of criticizing the manner in which the lawyer read the will, would you? No. But you would be all attention and all attentive to hear whether anything was left to you. And if so, how much? And that is the way to hear God's gospel. It's a will. It's God's will for your life. There's stuff in this will that he wants you to have. It has your name written all over it. But you gotta hear. You gotta listen. The Bible. The Bible is God's revealed truth. If you listen with the view of obedience, you will be blessed. Because simply this is what it is. There are riches there for you. If you will listen carefully as God speaks, you're going to find those riches. What are your thoughts about the idea of listening and what we've kind of talked about here regarding these verses? I know it's a lot to chew on, but you can see how when you break it down from the sower to the soil to the hearer, the hearing is applied on all of those. So, what are some things that we could do as we listen to God's word that maybe we're not doing right now? Or, as you've read those scriptures, what are some thoughts that come across your heart, across your mind? Don't advise me the ones. <laughs> yes. I really find this interesting because my daughter and I were having a conversation on the way to church tonight. And I was talking about my father when I was about 12 years old, sort of teaching about Revelation and the rapture. And it freaked all the kids out. And the church asked him not to speak on it anymore. As we were talking, we realized we had a different way of looking at the Bible back then. It was not real to us, it was all theoretical. And you know, images and voice to start for. And I think the important thing starting with the Jesus Revolution was that we started taking the Bible seriously, we started taking it literally, and we started taking it personally. And that's when the Bible starts to make the difference. You don't see the Bible as God's word, you see no need to read it or listen to it. Make it personal, like that old preacher talked about. Apply it. To, for God so loved the world is one thing. For God so loved the rest, if I be so bold, is enough. For God so loved his certain name. Now it's a whole other matter. Because it's about you. Not the world. You. One on one. Mono and mono. One on one. You gotta bring it home. Any other thoughts that will be put on your heart regarding the listener, regarding how how this all plays out? Because Jesus really gets to the heart of that. It, it, it really is. He, he cuts right to the quick. And I, I think, you know, as we looked at last Sunday, when we, when we finish up and look at some of the things that we talked about there. Um, it is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of what, what God desires for us to do. But it is in, in the listening, okay? I need to cry out to God for them. Remember Sunday, we had that verse of Scripture, Proverbs 2, verses 3 and 5. That's a great verse. If you cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it, as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. That is a great verse of scripture. What is it in, what does that verse imply? Read portions of your Bible with the needle staring at the hunger, or a hunger. Sorry. That's what I um meant we spoke on it on Sunday. So I like that. Hunt, hunt for it, search for it, search the scriptures. We all know the, you know, the Bible that had those guys called Bereans. Remember the people at Bereans? What they do? They search the scriptures. Paul would go up and he would. This is Paul, okay? He would lay.
lay out the Word of God for them, and they go, that's good, Paul. Now they're going to go home, and they're going to open up the Old Testament, and they're going to see what, if Paul was right in what he was saying. Always check the Word of God against anything that anybody says. That's, that's me or anybody else. Check the Word of God against what's being said. That, that's it. But he talks about you know, insight. He says, if you cry out for insight, that proverb, that, that if is a closet. That means there are a lot of folks that don't cry out for insight. They just want to superficially hear the word of God. Oh, that sounds so good. Oh, that's really good. And you walk away and they go, uh, you ask them, what did God say to you? Uh, 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 God didn't say anything. He was speaking. They weren't here. They weren't, they weren't listening. You have to search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Any other thoughts? It reminds me of the dirt. You know, we were talking about the different types of soil. And um, all, all of us at one point or another in listening to God's word and have a, a, a rocky dirt. So often I find that
Father, I come before you right now. I thank you so much for this evening. I thank you, Lord, for your hand. I thank you, Lord, for doing what you do, and only you can do it, Lord. And that is, take a sinful heart, transform it from the inside out, give us a brand new heart, give us a brand new life, give us light. And we can shine it into the darkest places, Father, and be able to share the light of Jesus Christ, the light of life. That's what it says. Help us do this, Lord. Lord, I thank you for every man and woman tonight. I thank you for those who are going to be watching this on <coughs> YouTube. Lord, I ask you, guide, Father, to speak to the hearts of everyone who's listening and everyone who's watching. For we ask in Jesus' name. And together we said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen.